Actually, one of the things that I'm really happy to hear at the cloud track today is how to use cloud services in gaming, not why to use cloud services in gaming. That's a, that's a really important thing to hear. I'm Mike Hines, and I've worked at Microsoft, I've worked at Amazon, I've done four of my own startups, two of which were successful, one of which lost everything, and one of which I actually run today as a hobby. But what I want to talk to you about right now is what I wish I had known about cloud services before I started my education startup. And it'll be, it'll be a good overview of kind of where they stand in relation to one another. So the first thing I want to uh, talk to you about is uh, how I chose these three that I want to compare today. First of all, if you're a startup, we know you've got limited runway. You don't have an endless amount of money. So why don't I look at some of the really less expensive cloud services that are out there? Well, when I was doing the education startup, I did exactly that. I went with a local Seattle company that was offering some cloud services for a fraction of the price of AWS, which was really the dominant player at the time. And, well, that ended up being my second worst professional decision. Um, possibly my third worst, depending on how today's presentation goes, but um, <laughs> okay, just kidding. Um, so that, that wasn't a good idea. So I've decided to use these criteria represented by the bullet points here. Go ahead and take a photo. And that got me down to about five cloud providers. To get down to three, I took a look at how these cloud providers responded to the cloud hopper virus. And that quickly got me to the three that we're talking about today, uh, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft. So how are we going to compare those three today. I want to look at capacity and reach or infrastructure, the services and ability to manage those services, and finally price. What I'm going to do is I'm going to list that bullet point on this handy little graph that I've made, and we'll go ahead and, and kind of see where they stand in relation to one another. So first, let's go with infrastructure. To start off with, I'd like to kind of briefly cover regions, which are areas in which a cloud service provider keeps all of their hardware. Regions are intentionally isolated from one another. If you want to use uh, your region to talk to another region, you go out to the internet and you do it through the services interface. Availability zones are separate data centers that make up a region, and these availability zones are connected with private high speed, high bandwidth, almost backbone speed connections. So it's really fast. If you've got a massive multiplayer game online and you're ingesting a ton of data, you can actually back up that data from one availability zone to another availability zone for really good location redundancy and relocation backup um, at very fast speeds. Now, not everyone has designed their network the same way. And I'd like to use this slide as an example of that. You see on the first and third line that uh, AWS and Google Cloud Platform uh, have both have about the same number of regions and about the same number of availability zones, getting you sort of similar coverage worldwide. But look at Azure. My gosh, what's up with Azure? That's really different, isn't it? They started their cloud infrastructure model with a different assumption. They kind of treated regions as equivalent to availability zones. And when they needed to scale out, they just built another region nearby. It's not necessarily worse or not necessarily better, but it is different. So when you're looking at data like this on websites, trying to decide which has the better infrastructure, understand that they're taking different approaches and don't take a look at the numbers thinking that you can actually compare them uh, when some include lots of availability zones, one and three, or not so many availability zones in Azure. Well, I'm going to give the edge to Amazon here. They've simply got a lot more time and a lot more reach. Uh, they've got better edge servers, good edge caches. The backbone speed between availability zones is really impressive. And you can actually go straight from a 5G network directly into a service, which is a really neat thing to be able to do, as opposed to having to go ahead and do that translation. If you're working on mobile games, Pocket Gamer, come on, who isn't? Um, having that 5G network access to your services is actually pretty important. Next, I want to talk about um, 
service models. So on this infrastructure, what are you delivering? AWS started this whole thing and has done a really good job of getting platform level stuff and infrastructure level stuff out to customers. Infrastructure level stuff is virtual servers, it is uh, 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 you know, basically spindles, uh, the hardware that you need to, to run a data center. The platform layer are the things that you run on top of that, like databases and stuff. Um, and really that's where Amazon has spent a lot of its time really honing its craft well. Google is taken after that and they've done something very similar. But Google also has a Chrome browser. Uh, that pops up the stack a bit. They've got also a Chromium client that pops up the stack a bit, and Google Docs, of course, um, which helps get them a little bit farther up the stack, but not nearly as far up the stack as Microsoft goes. Holy cow, these guys just are full range. They have Outlook servers, Outlook clients. They've got Office 365. I think they're even running Visual Studio as a service now, uh, in addition to the infrastructure and platform services that the rest of the cloud uh, provides. So on this one, uh, definitely Microsoft gets the nod on service models. Now you've got the stuff that you deliver. There are three choices in uh, how you're going to deliver that as a deployment model. Probably the most common one is the public model. This is what you think of when you think of cloud services. Uh, Amazon is really good at this one. Uh, they've been doing it for a long time. Second is a private uh, a private network, which is where you have dedicated hardware that only runs your stuff. If you're in a, a regulation-heavy environment, this may be a requirement. On Amazon, it's kind of virtual separate hardware as opposed to actual separate hardware, but Amazon will actually go to your data center and install AWS cloud services on your machines and your data center if you like. Uh, for this one, it's still pretty close. Um, a slight edge out to Microsoft and Google on that one. Now, this is where the real money is, the services that actually get the work done. Who's got what? Well, Amazon's been in the business the longest, and honestly, if, if Amazon needs something done internally, chances are they're using some of the AWS services that are available to you. So their own needs generate a lot of the services that they have, and their customer base, obviously the larger, largest customer base in the business now, is generating a lot of that too. Azure has have about half as many services as AWS does, but they've got the fastest growing customer base because they're taking a, a slightly different approach to the services that I'll talk about in a sec. Google Play, uh, sorry, uh, Google Cloud Platform took a little bit of time to figure out what they wanted to do when they grew up, uh, but they've got a fairly good handle on it now. And while they only have a little over 60 services available, they're really good, they're really high quality services. Definitely the edge here goes to Amazon for the depth, breadth, and uh, customization of the services that they have to offer. Those services can be broken down into several core component groups like Compute. Compute, uh, you get the virtual machines, serverless machines. Basically, these things are, are handled in large part at the base by the virtual machine uh, component and the serverless component level. All the cloud providers have roughly all the same stuff. Each provider has a, an advantage that they like to promote, but there's not a huge difference, and if there is a big difference, it doesn't last for long with the speed of improvements in the industry. Uh, advantage here to Amazon, simply because they just have more options to choose from and you have more configurable options. Second is storage, not database, but spindles. And everybody's got really slow, really cheap storage and really expensive, really fast storage. So there's really no huge advantage here. Maybe advantage AWS because they've got more choices and they're more configurable still. Next, I wanna talk about databases. This is where really interesting stuff happens. Certainly Azure and AWS have a lot of their own database solutions. Uh, AWS in particular has a larger selection of configurable database solutions for, your, for business needs. But data lakes are kind of like the big thing now. And being able to run analytics on relational data almost as quickly as it comes in 
is a big deal, and Google has a ton of that data. So they developed some technology, it's public now, it's, it's Hadoop, that was how you deal with this large set of relational, relational data spread over a whole bunch of different commodity priced servers. It's really good. It's also public. AWS and Azure have come up with some really great services that use Hadoop, and that's been really, that's been wonderful. The thing is, Google hasn't been standing still all of that time, and the next big thing that they've been using in their own data centers, they're now offering to customers as, uh, as a big query here. And when you pair BigQuery with Firebase, uh, which is something that Google offers as game services, that's actually a pretty powerful solution. So I'm going to give the advantage here to Google because that's just simply a really clean, really nice solution. Next is the network. Network, I'm talking IP availability, IP configuration, load balancers, load balancer configuration, failover speeds, that, that kind of work. Uh, here the advantage goes to Amazon. Uh, it's just there are more options, they're more configurable, and there are some important things you just actually can't do with your IP addresses on Azure or, or on GCP. Next is analytics. This is kind of the second part to that whole data structure thing. Amazon has had a lot of experiences with a lot of analytics, and that's going to give you a whole bunch of choices. But a BigQuery and Firebase together for game developers, man, that's just super easy. And it's pretty powerful. So that bears watching. Microsoft has some really good machine learning and AI technology that they're coming out in an Azure stream that also bears watching. But I'm going to give the, uh, the advantage here over to Google on analytics. Moving on to tools. What do I mean by tools? Tools are uh, the ability to manage all of these services, customize them to do what you want. Um, without question, the most powerful and complete belong to AWS. All of that complexity can make it a little bit challenging to learn and challenging to use. To get simplicity of operation, get up to speed, get running quickly, uh, the edge goes to Azure. Azure's tool set is not as complete as I think it needs to be, but boy is it simple to learn and fast to get set up. But for these other considerations, uh, definitely tools is a solid win for AWS. Next, important to, you know, really important to you guys, game developers, are the game services that they offer. Uh, game services, I'm going to include everything that, for example, AWS has, um, Amazon has. Things like Lumberyard, which is a free AAA quality game engine that you can actually get the source code for, for free. It works really well with AWS cloud services. Um, they've also got... Um, uh, Game Sparks and Game Lift, which they've they've acquired, they could be a little bit, they could be integrated a little bit better. Uh, Google Play has, uh, Google, sorry, Google Cloud Services, Google Cloud Platform, has Firebase and Azure, uh, a Firebase, I'm sorry, Firebase and BigQuery. Let me start over on that one. Google Cloud Platform has Firebase and BigQuery, which are awfully powerful when put together and bear considering. But my favorite here has got to be Azure and their combination with PlayFab. That is tight. It's really clean. It's really easy to implement. And it's pretty powerful stuff. They've got the same things that everybody else has, leaderboards, achievements, player matching. But they also do fraud detection that really well. And they also do revenue optimization really well. And that puts them as my favorite game services provider. All right, let's talk about price. Because at the end of the day, you're going to have to pay something. Cost management, is it easy to understand what you're going to pay next month, and is it easy to understand what you've paid this month? Well, honestly, um, it's not actually easy to understand um, uh, what, what AWS is charged. There are actually third-party companies that have the only business of figuring out what you've been charged and how you can actually manage your cost structure for future quarters. 
that, again, that complexity that Amazon enables kind of catches up to it when you try to figure out the billing and exactly what you've been charged for. Um, easy to understand, much easier are Azure and Google Cloud Platform, so the win goes to them on cost management. Actual out-of-pocket price, if you're a AAA studio, you're going to have an account manager call you and set up a sweet deal, so don't worry about that. But if you're an independent, AWS tends to be on the more expensive side. Google Cloud Platform tends to be on the less expensive side. So the win here is going to go to Google Cloud Platform. Now, Amazon and Microsoft aren't sleeping at the wheel here. They understand how this works. So they've offered some price assistance. As a matter of fact, all three services offer some price assistance. Google Cloud Platform for startups will help you um, lower the cost of cloud credits. Amazon Activate can lower the cost of AWS credits. BizSpark by Microsoft will help you lower the cost of Azure credits and lower or eliminate the cost of your Microsoft server licensing. This is huge. If you happen to be a Microsoft shop, uh, being able to get a lot of your Microsoft licenses for free is big. That gives the advantage to Microsoft when it comes to cost help. When you take a look at this in whole, where do you land? Um, is there a winner um, or not? Well, I mean, I don't want to say, hey, based on how quickly developments are happening and how competitive all three services are, we're the winners. That's, that's too pat, right? But what I want you to do is take a look at this and figure out which areas are important to you? For example, if you already run a data center with your own hardware and a Microsoft stack, Azure is going to look a whole lot more attractive. So I want you to take Azure and some of the next services and just eliminate one of, one of the others and do a deeper dive on the two that you select. If having the ultimate capability is really important to you, you're going to want to pick AWS as your first one and find something else that's really important to you. So for example, if analytics, database, and, and a lot of options are important to you, you might want to look at AWS and Google Cloud Platform. So pick the three things, the three services that are most important to you, find out where they land, pick two of these three and then do a deep dive. Uh, at least that should save you a little bit of time in figuring out which of the cloud service platforms is gonna be best for you guys. Hopefully I was able to get you a little bit of time back because I know we're behind. Um, I will be available all the rest, of, well, okay, there's not much of today left, but all day tomorrow if you guys wanna catch up to me and ask me questions. Thank you very much for coming and staying uh, 20 minutes late for the talk, I appreciate it. Thanks.